one thing before I let Dr. Stevenson start talking, I want to mention that uh, there will be a question answer period at the end of this presentation where you will be able to unmute your mic and ask questions and we can have a nice discussion. Uh, in the meantime, if you're afraid that you might forget your question, take advantage of the chat box at the bottom where you can log your question and we'll get back to it uh, at an appropriate time. So with that, uh, I'll turn the floor over to Dr. Stevenson. Okay, you guys are gonna disappear. I'm a novice at Zoom, so if, if, if I say some things that sound ridiculous, it's because I use a different system for online teaching. So, see what I can do. Huh. Okay, uh, Dr. Rollins has given the title and most of you know what seals look like. Bunch of seals there in the foreground and background. Wait a minute, those are not seals. No, there's something else, something you guys think are cute, but they're not in actuality cute critters, as you'll find out. Well, the story, my story starts in 1990, which is ancient history. I went to a meeting, my college, an international mycological meeting in Regensburg, Germany. And I happened to meet a guy, I didn't know him beforehand at breakfast one morning, who was from the Australian Antarctic Division. And I met him and we got to know each other. And finally he asked, he said, would you have any interest in going to Macquarie Island? And I said, where's that? I had no idea where it was. Well, it's in the sub-Antarctic, it's way down south. One thing led to another. And five years later in 1995, I had the opportunity to go to Macquarie. Now this is important if you're a scientist or biologist, any kind of scientist actually, Research is a process of exploration and discovery. Now, I've been teaching for more than 40 years. I wish most of my students realized that this was the case, but some do and some don't. Now, I mentioned I started an International Mycological Congress. Uh, the guy I met with was, was a guy named Rod Seffelt, again, Australian Antarctic Division. And uh, when you do something, you really need funding and some of the funding came from the National Science Foundation and some of it came from Australia. I guess one reason he asked me is that I had started doing research in the Arctic in 1989 uh, in Alaska. And that's one of the places I was doing research in Alaska. Those mountains in the background, that's the Brooks Range, the northernmost mount, range of mountains in North America. And that white stuff is snow and it, this, the date happens to be July 22nd. Think about that, snow, but it's awfully far north and can be awfully cold. The research in the foreground, I wasn't involved in that, but I was aware of it. That's research on climate change. Wait a minute, 19, way back then, 1989. Yes, those scientists were convinced already that we're undergoing climate change. Now this is where Macquarie Island is located. Uh, if you look, uh, that little speck, corner is not the easiest thing to use, but there's Macquarie Island, the yeah. Auckland Islands, Campbell Island, I'll say a little bit more about those. This is the continent of Antarctica. That's Tasmania, it's Australia, it's New Zealand, wonderful places. Most of those are very, very wonderful places. Now, Macquarie Island was actually discovered in 1810, which is a long time ago. It's politically part of Australia, probably should be part of New Zealand, but it's not. It's a World Heritage Site because it's incredibly unique. Now, the Australian Antarctic Division has put a station, a station on Macquarie, uh, has a small group of people, uh, scientists mostly and techs who support them. Uh, during the winter, it dwindles down to a dozen or 13 or so. Uh, during the summer, it will increase to 30-ish. My visit was in 1995 from January to May. and. Where do you, how do you get to Macquarie? You typically go to Hobart, Tasmania. Now, Macquarie Island is actually an exposed part of the of a ridge, an undersea ridge where two continental plates come together. It's uplifted from the seafloor. It's never been connected to any other landmass. And that way it's unique in all the world. Oh, it's only about 21 miles long and three miles wide at the widest point. So it's not a big island at all. Uh, it's a very, Congenial place, nice shopping. Wait a minute, no, no, that's Hobart in Tasmania. 
a very civilized place, but again, that's where you go to go to Macquarie. That's the Antarctic vision. Yeah, there's some model penguins and seals and whatever else you, you kind of know that it's the Antarctic division. Uh, this is a ship I went down on, the Astrolab, which is a French ship. They were actually going all the way to the Antarctic continent, but they were gonna drop a few of us off on the way on Macquarie. It's not easy to get there. This is a closer view. Uh, nice ship, all things considered. Uh, one problem when you go to the Southern Ocean, it tends to be pretty stormy. Uh, when we went down, we encounter waves at 12 meters, that's about 40 feet, think about that. And we were tossed about, in fact, it was a four day trip down. Uh, most of the time I spent in a bunk with a strap on it, so I'd get tossed on the floor. Uh, it was a horrible experience. Uh, I was very, very glad when it was over. Uh, worst storm of the season, we lucked out, wow. Uh, of course, if you're aboard a ship or in a house or in a lab or whatever else, sometimes you have to answer the call of nature. That's the politest way I could say it. And it was kind of tough. You you walk down the hall and you get thrown against the walls. You were just kind of blue and black by the time the voyage was over. All I can remember eating in four days was one orange and one piece of bread. And he said, well, you'll probably always remember that. Yes, I will. No question about that. This is the first view we had of Macquarie Island. The north head is this part right here. Uh, the seas were still pretty choppy, but they, they were gonna, well, I say they're gonna drop us off. I'll say more about that. Uh, this shot was taken later in the visit. That's a Russian icebreaker out there. That's a whole different story, but they came out to get us in these Zodiacs like this. And the, again, the sea was really choppy, choppier than what you see here. And they said, well, toss your stuff off and then jump. Whoa. Uh, I had some misgivings, but I did make it. Otherwise I wouldn't be giving this talk, right? I had two duffel bags to toss and I really wondered if if I miss, what am I gonna do? That's all my clothing, supplies. This is the station on Macquarie on a very nice day and the buildings and whatever else. Uh, kind of, it's marginal, but it has some advantages. Uh, what are the advantages? Now, we were considered to be, at the time, while I was on Macquarie, probably the most isolated humans on Earth. Oh, that means there's nothing really close to Macquarie. But they said, you know, there's enough fuel, enough food. If the Earth crashes and we survive, we have enough for a year and a half. Well, that's some comforting, I guess. Uh, that's the station. That's the north head in the background. That's an elevated little peninsula that extends out uh, that, well, isthmus really, that connects the North Head with the main island. The main island is an elevated plateau. Uh, it, the highest part of the plateaus are pretty desolate because again, we're so far, far south. Uh, this is a different view, another view. And uh, the most important building is probably the long one here because, well, the mess hall is there. That's the biggest thing. The two things, the red things in the, in the foreground are called dongas. They're survival shelters of the type used on the Antarctic con continent. And I shared one of those during the four months I was there. Neat place. Uh, you can just barely stand erect in the middle of it. Get some indication of what it looks like. And yeah, that was me in 1995. I was meaner then. Well, I don't know about that. Uh, that's my bed. Uh, pretty limited mattress, but, and apparently narrow too, but eh, you can survive. Uh, these are important buildings too, especially the one here, because that's where our, all of our food supplies were stored. The other buildings are pretty much little shops. There's one other building I'll show you later, but just a closer view. And you go in there and, ooh, canned food, dried food, there's actually one big freezer. So we've actually had, had some things that weren't dried or, or canned. And, oh my goodness, liquid stuff, Coke, beer, and orange juice, a supply for a long time. And we were, we were allocated a certain number. I don't, I'm a non-alcoholic, so I didn't have any of the beer, but 
I did have some of the Cokes. One of the things that is practiced on Macquarie that's kind of neat, uh, the RTA means return to Australia. Anything they cannot burn on Macquarie is stored up and ultimately taken back to Australia. They don't want any waste on the island. This is a typical day with fog over the plateau. Uh, this is a radio antenna. That's, that was our only contact with the outside world. And these little guys are, well, you'll see what they are in a minute. You also see these seal fences, which is what they're for. Okay, this is our radio communication with the outside. And uh, most of you don't remember 1995, but the internet was coming into existence. People were starting to use it. Uh, my, I had just started using it. My wife learned how to use it while I was on my quarry because that was really the only contact. Now there was a credible time difference, but usually my, the, the lab in which I worked, uh, there was a computer. I mean, this is old crude internet. I'd go in the morning and hopefully get a message from her that would make my day. Even something like saying, oh, I went to the grocery store. Well, that meant a lot to me. Uh, this is the biology building with, again, seal fence around it. Uh, no central heating. I mean, you, you manage. There was a little space heater, one little space heater. That's divided into two rooms. That was a biology room where we worked, and there was one little space heater in it. And you look at that, and you say, what is all that stuff? Well, there are tubes for culturing. Uh, there are specimens out there. There's a mushroom dryer here, that red thing. And well, that's yours truly. And that's a microscope and looking at specimens that have been collected on a field. Ah, that's where we had internet access. This is most of the group that was on the island during the four months that I was there. Uh, this guy is a leader. He was a project leader. This guy was a cook, he was an idiot. This is actually a physician. They had to have a physician on the island just in case something happened to us. It certainly could. Uh, this guy, well, actually looking at it, this guy was from New Zealand. Everything, everybody else there is from Australia, except for this guy who was a graduate student with me and actually was along on this expedition. Quite a group. Uh, this is our standard meal. No, it's not. When you're isolated and you, the only people you interact with are members of that group, there was just a tradition on Macquarie. Saturday evening, the Saturday dinner was special. And yes, they bring out wine and well, what you see there. It was special, it's simply put. And yes, people would dress up sometimes and this was not Saturday dinner, there were some visitors to the lab trying to see what we were doing, but uh, this is a special Saturday dinner. Yes, we had a few females on it, uh, on the station. Uh, a tradition that's kind of hard to explain. Uh, they call it ducks on a pond, which I, I don't really know where that came from, but it was a Saturday night in which everybody cross-dressed. In other words, guys wore dresses if they had them, and the girls are dressed as you see there. Wow, I didn't take a dress along, so I kind of stood out. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Uh, the girl in the center was actually going to overwinter, and I got to know her fairly well. She was a cat ranger. Jenny was a cat ranger. So what the heck is a cat ranger? Well, there are feral cats, or were then, feral cats on Macquarie that the Australian Antarctic Division wanted to eliminate. So they put some people on the island. Their main responsibility was to go out and shoot cats. Now the feral cats were very secretive. They didn't get one very often, but that was their job. Some of you are saying, well, I'd love to have that job. Well, maybe not. Uh, this is one of those little buildings. This is another evening. Uh, sometimes we would go in the evening. I mean, there's not much to do, but there was one little building uh, that you look at those. Yes, those are tapes, the old tapes. We didn't have DVDs in those days. And there was one little television and we'd pull a movie out and a lot of evenings we'd watch the movie. And in theory, the first person in there got to pick the movie. And it's kind of neat. Oops, sorry about that. There you go. 
look at all those movies. Uh, I know my, well, Gary Larson, the American, he's from the University of Alaska, one night couldn't sleep. So he went over and watched all of the Crocodile Dundee movies. Wow. Never did that. Uh, I said that these people are idiots. Uh, I, I'm sure that at Adams University, there are no idiots. There are plenty of idiots at the University of Arkansas, though. There is a leader, Alan, and yep, that's yours truly, and my camera, in fact. Uh, this is something that's necessary. Uh, this guy was the diesel operator. He was responsible for the diesel engines that supplied power, but he also doubled to do haircuts. And my hair started getting long, and I don't like long hair. So he gave me a haircut. Neat. One day, and remember this, the summer has flipped down there because we're in the Southern Hemisphere. One day we got a high over the island, fairly still air, no clouds, and it warmed up enough above freezing. So we actually had an outdoor cookout for lunch. Wow, neat. neat. Yeah, the wildlife everywhere. I mean, this guy, uh, this is out in the field, uh, out collecting, actually doing some photography. And two of the people from the Australian crew and, and Gary Larson. And yeah, we were looking around for fungi and slime moles. And actually the people, the other people there were became really enthusiastic about what we were doing. And they'd look for mushrooms and bring them back, uh, usually common stuff, but occasionally they'd bring back something that was worthwhile. We had a couple little things happen on the way. That's a Russian helicopter. There was a Russian ship not too far from Macquarie that had a sailor, had a medical emergency, and they were aware that we had a physician. So they actually sent a helicopter from the ship to pick up the physician to take, take him to treat their person and obviously bring him back. And I happened to be in at the station that day and I looked at the helicopter. Wow. Now, the ecology of Macquarie, and if, if you're a biologist, you know that weather varies and weather is reflected of climate and so forth. Some days it rains, some days it doesn't. But the ecological setting on the court, low temperatures throughout the year, a short field season, not a lot of substrates for fungi and things. And of course the relative isolation. And one of the questions we wanted to ask what we were doing there, how did things get to Macquarie? If it's never been in contact with any other landmass and it's the middle of nowhere, how, how do things get there? This is up on the plateau. There are scattered lakes up there. They freeze solid in the winter. There's hardly anything in them living. I mean, they freeze solid, so that pretty much excludes. And the very highest elevations on the island are almost polar deserts and quite bare. And that's a lake frozen solid in the winter. I wasn't there in the winter, but Jenny, that, that cat ranger, sent me some photographs. Uh, this is a, another good day, and I'm actually near the coast, looking back on the plateau, and you see that robin? Wait a minute, that's not a robin. That's an albatross. That's an albatross. Wow. And this is one of the lowland areas. Most of these are grasses. There are other plants that you, you get to as you ascend the plateau. This is looking actually from the beach back at the station at North Head. And that's seaweed in the foreground. And also a sleepy guy here. You wouldn't want to step on him though. This is looking down the other way. These are two little islands. Whoops, sorry about that. Called the Nuggets. And there's a really nice collecting area around that point if you go beyond it. This is up on top of the island. And it's possible to get on one of the high points and see both to the east and to the west. And what is interesting is, except if you go south or north of Bacquarie where there's no landmass, in theory, if you could look far enough, you could see the back of your head. Hmm. So there's nothing in between. It's also true that we had some neat experiences up on top. Uh, saw a, a pot of whales swim by one time. This is on the east side of the island. These are little valleys cut into the plateau. The, the brown stuff is actually a fern. 
But these, that's about as rich as the vegetation gets on Macquarie. Uh, these were wonderful collecting places. There were little streams coming out. Again, nothing in the streams or hardly anything in the streams. Just another view. Oh, our packs and stuff we were collecting. There are these little plateaus. Well, not really plateaus, little beaches, literally, along the edge, some parts of the island. And they're just, well, the few plants that are there certainly take over. This is Hasselberry Point, named after the guy who discovered Macquarie. And that was pr probably the collecting site we used the most. It was, oh, about a 20 minute walk from the station and not a bad place. Now, the one problem on Macquarie is that it tends to be very windy. We would collect, go out collecting on days when the wind was 40 or 50 miles per hour. Well, down there it's not, but you follow what I mean. And you really could hardly stand up, but you could crawl around and look, and most of the things we were collecting pretty small, so you do that. But if you got close to the plateau, that would represent some shelter. It makes things a little easier. This is on Pla on Hasselberry, or ha Hasselberry, if I can say it. Uh, the plants occur in rows, apparently because of the prevailing winds. This plant is, is called Plurophyllum. It's a a relative of the daisy, and it's an asteraceous thing. And you can see some more in the background. And part of that that little shelf, uh, I had not heard the term before I went to Macquarie, feather beds. I said, what the heck are feather beds? Well, if you walk out on there, there are areas that are dominated by leafy lowerts. Now, they're kind of like the quaking bogs in Alaska, which I have I've seen and experienced. You jump up and down and what you're standing on goes up and down with you. Whoa, that's a feather bed. There are some protruding rocks in places and the white plant, the whitish plant is a plurophyllum. Uh, most of the brown there are various mosses and you get some thing, there's a plant called stilbocarpus that creeps up that rock. This is called Green Valley. It's a lush valley about midway down the slope and doesn't look all that green. We were there a little later in the seasons, which accounts for that, the non-green, at least in part. But when the sun comes out, eh, you can see some green, but not a lot of plants. We didn't find a lot there. The tallest plant on Macquarie can be more than a meter tall. It's, it's a poa, it's a grass, poa poliosa, which actually limited to Macquarie. And in places on the island, you'd pretty much have to travel by jumping. It's a tussock grass. You'd have to jump from one tussock to the next uh, for a reason, which I'll come back to. This is about as diverse as the vegetation gets over most of Macquarie. And there's a plurophyllum. There's a, the, still, that's what plurophyllum looks like. The green in the background, that's, that's po polo there. And then, and then, Macquarie Island cabbage, so-called, Stilbocarpa. But that's plurophyllum, uh, really tough leaves. That's Macquarie Island cabbage, Stilbocarpa. It's a member of the Rayleigh-Aceae. Uh, and you can eat it. People strand, there have been people stranded on Macquarie back in the old days and uh, pretty much had to eat penguins and Macquarie Island cabbage. Uh, penguin apparently is pretty bad. Uh, this, I sampled a little bit of it. I wouldn't recommend it, but it, it's edible. This is up on the high plateau, the, one of the stretches of the plateau that gets as high as any place on Macquarie. And you see the stakes, that's a trail. You say, well, I can see the trail, why the stakes? Well, a lot of the time this gets fogged in and you can't see the trail. And let's put it this way, if you wander off in the wrong direction, you could lose your life. There have been a number of deaths on Macquarie from, I mean, people working in the field. So they were, we had to do a training session before they even let us leave the station, but not, not a good place to mess around. And that's what the primary vegetation looks like. Those are mosses, There's not much else. A few lichens scattered here and there. This is one day, that's me in my expensive thousand dollar rain suit, the Australian Antarctic Division allowed me to keep while I was there, but I had to turn it in. Anything in contact with your skin, though, they let me keep the gloves I still have. But 
on this day, it started snowing and sleeting and the wind started picking up and we were several hours away from the station and it actually was, the snow was blowing sideways. I mean, it was really getting bad and there, there, there are survival huts on the island, but they're not on the plateau. They're down over the edge. So we had to find a way to get down over the edge and not real easy, but we finally made it to a hut. And otherwise, if we'd been trapped up there, I mean, the weather really got bad. Um, somebody else would be giving a seminar today. Whoa, this is toward the end of the visit. And the reason I mention this is that, ooh, fresh fallen snow is starting to snow. But near the end of the visit, before we went off, before we left the island, all of the empty canisters and the trash and whatever else were put in, put in little cages, little pallets that were going to be uplifted to the ship to be taken away. And for several days, everybody on the station worked on packing up this stuff and getting it ready to move out. Uh, these guys stayed there. This is an elephant seal. That's Doc. Dr. Seffelt, who spent a short period on the island, he was actually able to leave on a fishing boat, which was a horrible experience getting back to Australia, but he couldn't afford to stay the four months. 15 feet long and three tons. They make wonderful pets, wonderful pets. Everybody should have one. I don't think so. Whoa. Looks like a good life, doesn't it? I mean, they don't look very industrious. Well, I. I still don't think I would mess with them. These are yearlings, and they sometimes get nestled down among those tussocks, and you don't see them until you're right on them, and that guy can bite. That's one of the reasons you jump from tussock to tussock. Wow, and those elephant seals fight, fight over females, and uh, this guy, we were not supposed to do this, but he'd been there a while and took a chance. I mean, would you imagine sticking your hand in that mouth? Wouldn't it be neat to talk about later? You might not be able to shake hands with anyone anymore, but it'd be neat to talk about. This is something we had to do from time to time. I remember I talked about the seal fences. These would actually come into the station. That low fence will stop them, but if you leave the gate open, they'll come in. You have to take a broom. Broom usually works. You swat them in the head and they'll back up. Uh, sometimes, and this happened a couple of times, they'll take a swipe and bite through the handle of the balloon, or the broom, if I can say it. <coughs> yeah, they were these guys. Uh, penguins, penguins, penguins. This little guy is actually, it's called the royal penguin, and it's native to, essentially indigenous to Macquarie. That's the only place in the world you find them. But they're more than that here. Uh, the king penguin, which I'm going to show you, the gentoo penguin, the rockhopper penguin, and there are other penguins that come in occasionally. The emperor comes in from the continent. The chin strap comes in from the continent. They don't breed on the island, but they do come by. And penguins can be pretty common. The largest colony I saw on Macquarie estimated 250,000 birds in one place. They are loud. They are dirty. They are smelly, but the movies don't convey that, do they? No, they don't. Wow, that's not the largest colony, but it's pretty good sized. Hmm. Sometimes penguins migrate some distance inland uh, where the slope is gentle and they form these inland colonies, kind of neat. Now this is a king penguin. It's the second largest of all penguins and it's a lot more colorful. Uh, there were a lot of kings on the island. They, they would come wandering into the station from time to time too. I think they're pretty. Again, they're smelly and loud and all that, but eh, they're pretty. Now, one thing we learned, penguins are you know, wary of you. I wouldn't say fearful of you, but wary of you if you stand tall. But if you get down to their level, they will actually attack you. That big old colony you just saw, if you were careful, you could slowly walk through it. But the last thing I'd ever want to do is to try to crawl through it. Of course, you'd be, a, well, crawling through penguin poo, but you did, wouldn't want to get down their level. No way. 
This is the gentoo, which is quite common on the Antarctic continent. There weren't as many gentoos on the island, but eh, there are little groups of them, especially around the station. And, and then the rock hoppers. These are little penguins, the smallest penguin. And they were found in the rocky areas that there'd be little caves. There actually was a cave at one end of the island that you could walk through to, to get to another collecting site. And they were all in there. And these, these you could actually pet, pet on the head if you wanted to. I mean, it probably shouldn't do that, but you could. Wow, that's our dinner. No, it wasn't our dinner. Uh, whales like this, that's creel. Some of you have heard of creel, I'm sure. Uh, my wife's major name, maiden name was Creel. A little different spelling, but that's Creel. Well, that's an unhappy story. When, well, seals are good for oil, source of oil. And the sealers came down and they kill, killed lots of seals. So there are hardly any seals left on the island. And then they looked around and said, you know, penguins probably have oil in those too. And they did. So they pretty much reduce the penguin population. What they do, they boil them for the oil, boil, boil them to separate the oil. And these are old boilers. I mean, it, it's a hideous job. They have a little place, have a little fences put up so the penguins would go by one th or through the gap one by one. And there'd be a designated, well, baseball bat hit penguin person, if you follow me. And they toss them into the di digester, as it were. Crazy. But that went on. And you can still see evidence of the day. The penguins have come back because Macquarie is now protected. The seals have come back because Macquarie is protected. Uh, that's an example of what conservation can do. Whoa, there's Gary. Wait a minute. Most of you know what gulls are, I bet. That's not a gull. That's a wandering albatross, the bird with the widest wingspan of any bird on earth. Now, we were told to keep well away from these, stay, you know, many meters away. I had a telephone, no, I don't have a telephone lens, didn't have it that day. They were curious, they'd come up to us. Wow, that's about as close as you want to get to a wandering albatross. I mean, these things would come swooping in to land and pretty much like a pterodactyl, in other words, a flying dinosaur, really neat. I discovered that they didn't really care too much for the plastic specimen bags, but uh, they were neat to see that close, close up. There have been some things that have been introduced to Macquarie. Rats, rats go everywhere man does. Mice, yeah. Rabbits, cats I've already talked about. A few plants have been introduced now. There's been, certainly been an effort to eradicate all of those. Uh, there's a little bit of a problem. They eliminated the cats first and the rabbits just exploded and affected the vegetation. So you really have to look at balance in things when you're doing conservation and exterminations. This is one of the survival shelters on the island that you'd stand overnight if you're well out. And, and actually, that's a survival shelter that we went to when we came down over the plateau on that really bad day. And you say, I see something in the foreground. I wonder what those are. Well, I'll tell you, are the survivor shelters big? We'll have a lot of room to work at? No, they're basically survival shelters and just that with a couple of bunks inside, uh, a food supply, including big old Cadbury chocolate bars. I won't say any more about those, but anytime I spend a night in, the in one of the shelters, survival shelters, one of the chocolate bars disappeared. Whoa, this is just outside the survival shelter. Those are kings and the brown things are baby kings. Yep, those are the baby, the chicks. And they're mostly feathers. They're fluff balls, but they're mm, kind of cute, I guess. This is one of the survival shelters on the other side of the island. Uh, this is bigger, a little bit more elaborate as it were. Uh, and sometimes, this is one of the duties that we had on occasion, we use one of the Zodiacs to go down the island to resupply the shelters because people go through and they eat up all the stuff and you'd have to resupply them on occasion. And yeah, that's us. In fact, that's, that's yours truly, but we pulled up on the sand. We're re taking stuff to the survival shelters. Uh, that's a survival shoot suit that I had on. When we were offloaded from the from the astrolab in the beginning, they had us put on a on a suit, a complete suit. And anytime we went out in the zodiac, same thing. You said, well, "Why is that?" 
Well, if you go in that water, that water is frigid. You're not going to last very long. That survival suit enhances the chances of you surviving. So is it a good thing to wear? Mm, yeah. Wow. Are penguins curious? Yep, there's a zodiac and all those penguins are coming up to take a look saying, what's going on here? This is us in the field photographing some of the fungi. Sometimes you have to get very close and since the fungi are pretty small. Uh, these are some of the fungi. I know that you guys aren't necessarily mycologists. This is a little moss decomposer, decomposing moss. It, remember the genus Gallerina and they are all over the place. This is a hygrophorus and this occurs here in the U.S. Actually, this species probably occurs here, although if you do the molecular biology, you might find it's quite different. And that's another little hygrophorus. It's a little fleshy fungus. They're called inky caps. Uh, this is a cystoderma. Forget about that. That's a, actually a little coprinus. Have, there's an inky cap. You find them here. That's a little cup fungus, a little eyelash cup because of the hairs along the edge. And this is a, another, actually a baziza, another little cup fungus. And that's a slime mold. That's a myceid. He said, well, what are myceids? Well, have Dr. Rollins tell you, but he should be able to tell you. But these are not fungi, but uh, they, they were there in some of months. I made, I picked up more than 400 different collections on my quarry in, in that four month period. And just blew all the previous collections in the South Polar region all to heck. In fact, uh, we did a heck of a lot for fungi too. This is the guy that we discovered, well, we didn't, we discovered it on Macquarie Island. It had actually been collected once before, but it's an interesting fungus. It was described, collected for the first time in Argentina, and then collected on Macquarie Island in the late 1950s. And then it was collected in New Zealand for the first time about 10 years ago. He said, well, how is, how is it doing that? Well, it's a saprophytic fungus, decomposed dead organic matter or dead plant material. There's no question that it's being spread about because the spores are being dispersed by wind. That's a pretty clear cut example of that happening and actually being documented to some extent. Whoa, I thought, no, there are no trees, there are no woody plants on Macquarie, but this came in. Uh, some of you know the concept of rafting, a uh, trunk of a tree or some other plant material floats over the ocean and carries with it critters. This actually landed on Macquarie a couple of decades ago, we checked it out and I mean, it's totally sterile. There wasn't anything on it, but it was an interesting look at. And that's how plants and animals can sometimes get from one island to another. So it's ecologically important. Whoa, that's the, the ship that came down, the Australian Antarctic Division ship, which has actually been decommissioned, but it was used then, the Aurora Australis. And that's a helicopter, you see. This came in in May. We were expecting it. It was actually a little late. That's how we were going to get back to Hobart. But, and I mentioned this earlier, that's all the stuff that's packed up to go back to Australia. And the helicopter had to make multiple trips to carry all of that stuff from here out to the ship. But finally, they got all, all the stuff out. And they were going to make one more trip. And they said, well, do some of you want to go to, to the ship? In other words, be the first. And I raised my hand. I said, yes, I'd like to go to the ship. So I spent my last night on Macquarie, actually on a ship off the shore. Oh, they were allowed us to get on through the door. They didn't carry us out that way. This is on the ship. And those things were stored, actually stored out in the open deck. Uh, our specimens were all in one of them. We certainly hoped that they would get back to Australia. Fortunately, they did. This is the morning we left. We got a nice send off, a nice snowfall on the island. Uh, most of the snow is on the plateau, but uh, some down to sea level too. It's just a really nice snow. The, the winter was starting to set in. This is a group of people coming off the island. Uh, some of those had been there for a year. Uh, there were also some people that had actually come off the continent and were heading back to Australia. And eh, they looked kind of like a crazy group, but it was going to be good to get back to civilization. But the Southern Ocean, it wasn't quite as rough going back, but we were in a bigger ship. So we weren't 
well, we weren't subjected to quite as much abuse. Wow. That's not a sunset, it's actually a sunrise. I was looking to the east, but one morning I got out of the donga, it was pretty early. I think I got out of the donga because nature, I heard nature calling, but I saw this and I, whoa, I gotta get my camera. So I ducked back in and got my camera and got that shot. And of course I pretend it's a sunset, but people don't know the direction. It's actually a sunrise, but oh, that's kind of neat. I enjoy seeing that. I enjoyed seeing that on that morning. It's certainly a neat experience. But you go that far south and you get to see things. Hmm. You get to see the southern lights. Now, I've seen the northern lights in Australia, not in, sorry, in Alaska, not Australia. So I've seen the northern lights and the southern lights. Well, they, not a lot of people can say that. Now, the Macquarie Island visit was part of a larger project. I've been studying the Myxomycetes, the slime moles of New Zealand for a long time. Uh, I have made... 18 trips to New Zealand, 18 collecting trips over the years. I love the place, it's wonderful, wonderful. But I've also visited these other sub-Antarctic islands. Eh, sorry, sorry about that again. And those are the number of species of slime moles discovered in each place. And this is one of the few examples on planet Earth where you see a neat pattern, a latitudinal pattern of biodiversity that's been documented. You see the number of species goes up, 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 as you go north, and north the conditions are getting more favorable. Wow. Uh, thanks to COVID, this is not a positive thing, it's a negative thing. Last December, I was supposed to extend my work to Chatham Island, uh, back here. And COVID came along and I couldn't make that trip. So curse COVID, but COVID did a lot of bad things, as you know. Now, this research, you can't do things unless you have money. I mean, going out for dinner, you have to have money, okay. Research supported by grants from the National Science Foundation, the Australian Antarctic Division. And I appreciate some of the people who used or contributed some images to this presentation. And I will basically finish by saying, a lot of people would look at what I just described as incredible, but something I'd never really want to do. Uh, there were some rough edges, but it was certainly the most extraordinary experience I've ever had in my life. Would I do it again? Well, I wouldn't do it now because I'm too old to do it, but would I have done it again if given a choice? Yes. Uh, I was exceedingly lucky to have had that kind of opportunity. and I really consider it, a, again, an utterly fantastic experience. And for those of you that are still awake, I guess it's reaching question time. At least that what, what that's what I was told earlier. Dr. Rollins is supposed to take over. Yes, absolutely. So at, at this point, I, I want to thank Dr. Stevenson for giving a very interesting presentation and would like to open the floor to questions, discussions, comments. When you're fighting sleepers out of your eyes, did you sleep through it? No, huh? I, I stayed awake. Okay. Okay, I'm game for any question I can answer, but I mean... $500 for this, I have to answer questions, right? What? No honorarium. What? Out of the goodness of your heart. I don't have a good heart, I'm a bad person. Okay, questions. From anyone, I won't bite your head off. I can't do that this way anyhow. No Did questions. you say that it was four months that you were there? Yes, from mid-January to early May. Did most people stay about that amount of time or were there people that stayed year round? Well, there, there are a few people who, who spend the whole year there. Uh, normally, what the Australian Antarctic Division, at least half the people come in in mid to late fall. Uh, that would, didn't do us any good because fungi don't fruit then. So we were looking, we couldn't go in with main group. They had to find another way. That's why we went to the, on a French ship with everybody speaking French. Uh, but they, the French ship was hap happened to be going and they said, well, can you take some of our people along? So I was a member of a very small group that landed in January, but everybody was coming off except for the 12 or 13 people. I think there were 13 people that were going to overwinter that winter. And 
uh, I hate to tell you this, you might wipe the tears away. The people who were staying looked pretty forlorn when we left. I mean, they were they were facing six months of, of winter in basically isolation, solitude. I mean, they weren't smiling. <laughs> they were pretty glum, but you saw in that shot on the ship, we were all happy getting back. There was one sad thing though, for me, we got back to Hobart. There was one guy on the ship who had been there for a year who was due to get married within weeks. He was the first one off that ship. He just had to be the first one off that ship. But there, most people were ever, there was a little crowd there, greeters, you know, the people were going ashore. I didn't have anybody in that crowd that knew me, knew, knew my name. So there was no one there to greet me. So I just mosey off the ship and pretty forlorn. I mean, people were excited, kids were hugging and uh, nobody for me, nobody for me. And I didn't get to fly back to the States for several days. So uh, that was sad, but well, I shouldn't talk about things like that. Okay, next question. What Mine is Seal Space like? I don't know. <laughs> Mine is very trivial. Um, I was just going to ask if you sort of were always a cold hardy person. And so going into this um, appealed to some aspect of, of kind of your, I don't know, I, I'm a herpetologist and, you know, mostly work with lizards. Nothing there for you to study. Nothing there. I know. Well, that's it. But also I love working in, you know, hot tropical conditions. Um, and, you know, I know some biologists, some of I've what they've never been doing. south of North Carolina. What's Wait that? I've never been south of North Carolina. Wait a minute. <laughs> Somebody there knows I'm lying. Hmm. I've worked extensively in the neotropics, Southeast Asia, you name it. And I, I hate reptiles. <laughs> okay. Oh, really? But, <laughs> no, I don't hate reptiles. But no, I, it, there are certain aspects of working in the tropics. You stay warm and toasty. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not a cold person. I hate cold weather. I hate snow. The only oh. good snow is snow in the mountains in the distance and the Rocky Mountains, for example. But no, I'm cold hearted because I'm mean, not because I like cold temperatures. <laughs> okay. There's a difference. There's a real difference. But it's worth the, it's worth what you see being there to tolerate those cold conditions and wear those survival suits. Well, let's put it this way. Uh, the, our work on Macquarie tripled the number of species of fungi known from the South Polar region. Is that worthwhile? Oh yeah. As a, sci <laughs> as a scientist? Oh, the, the, the information we got from that visit was overwhelming. I mean, I'm, well, for, there were species new to science. Fact is there are probably a lot more that have never been worked up because you collect a lot of stuff and you, you have to, process and work it up and that requires a lot more time and effort than collecting it. Now there were days we couldn't collect in the field. There were really beastly days, but uh, it was it was an extraordinary experience. And I, like I say, I would do it again. I know that most people wouldn't and herpetologists would just be able to stay in the, I guess the dining hall and munch on food because it wouldn't be anything to do. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing. No problems. You don't have to go with me. <laughs> Come on, don't let the feral cat bite your tongue. Um, I, I'll ask a, a question, I have a couple of questions. And the, well, the first thing that I wanted to, well, this is Danielle Walters. I, my camera's not working, my camera's not on, but it's Danielle. Um, I, first I wanted to say that I, I'm surprised and I, I just can't believe that you don't already have some sort of program on National Geographic or something because this was extremely hilarious and informative at the same time. I really enjoyed your presentation and I was giggling a lot, but um, I also had a couple of questions. Um, I'm wondering about- let me, the answer, let me answer the first question. All right. Uh, the National Geographic <laughs> supports a lot of things that they don't do mm. articles on. I've actually had nine grants from the National Geographic to do work in exotic places in the world. Really? Uh, they have first dibs on all of my images. They have first dibs on anything I do, but they've never used any of that. Wow, interesting. I'm kind of, kind of disappointed. Yeah, that is disappointing. Well, I mean, I was already expressing that I was disappointed, but that was just because I wanted to watch, watch you on TV, that's all. 
Um, this, oh, this doing, doing that more. now, sort of. You, okay. That's right. I'm getting to. That's right. Um, but my question was regarding um, the penguins. And uh, you were talking about all the different types. I guess, is it breeds? Is that what you, what I should say? They're different, different, spe they're different species. Yeah. Different species of, of penguins. And I wondered if they, if they ever um, uh, intermix, not even necessarily for breeding, but, to, but if they just spend time together or only separate in their own colonies. It's actually more common on the Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, I've been there too. Uh, mm -hmm. You will see some colonies around the edges mixing. We didn't see very much evidence of that, although you, in a given area, you'd sometimes see the, you know, the Gentoos and the Kings, not really intermixing, but in the same place at the same time. They, they weren't cozying up to one another. Mm -hmm. But uh, so they pretty much keep separate. Uh, we did have some penguin research going on there that would appeal to herpetologists, not to mere normal people, but to herpetologists. We had a group of people who were actually looking to see, well, what seals and penguins eat. Of course, they go out to sea and they eat a lot of squid, to tell the truth. But what they do is hang the little beast and the yearling, think about this, yearling elephant seals, they'd hang them up, upside down, and put a tube down their throat and pump salt water in it. And not surprisingly, the, the animal would gurgitate, regurgitate everything in its stomach. And they have a little sieve, a little screen, and they catch all the stuff and they take it back to the lab and they can determine what the beast had to eat. Oh, wow. And I didn't, I had no interest whatsoever in that kind of research. No <laughs> way. I'd rather study slime molds and fungi. <laughs> okay. Oh, my goodness. Well, if, I, if you don't mind for me to ask one other little thing, I, I was wondering if you've kept up with... Um, I, don't, I mean, I, maybe it would be totally different people now, but with the with that base, with that field research base, and if you know anything about what it's what it's like now with modern, more modern technology, and what it's like out there now. Sure, they've upgraded some of the stuff. I actually do keep in touch with Rod Seffel, but I don't think he's been there. The biggest thing on Macquarie has been the conservation efforts to really make a balance or restore a balance, and the critters that are there. The vegetation has changed quite a lot. My mm -hmm. guess is, uh, I, I guess I, I really should have gotten, they have a web, web page like everything, get on the web page and take a look at it. But my guess is the place probably hasn't changed a lot. Uh, I mean, pretty expensive to do major construction in a place like that. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure they upgraded the internet and things like that. Although, again, they have to use that antenna that you saw in, the, in that dome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Not a problem. Again, $500 will come in handy. <laughs> I wasn't supposed to reveal that. That's under the table money. Right, right. The, yeah. checks, the checks in the mail. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll ask a question that's somewhat related to the, the technology. Some of the folks that we have with us today uh, were not alive during a time before the internet and smartphones. Can you, can you give us a, a bit of an idea of the state of communications and the internet and email? Like, could you send pictures in those days? Yes and no. Uh, I got one picture. Uh, I have a daughter, a wife and I have a daughter. And I knew someone at the university where I was working then who was pretty savvy on tech things. Adam probably remembers him, uh, but I questioned whether he could possibly send a picture of my wife and daughter about midway through the visit. And he worked it out so he could. So he went out, I mean, digital cameras were pretty crude back then, but he was able to, to acquire a digital image that he could send to Macquarie. And he actually sent it to, well, it was a little weather station on the island, which actually one of the more important things about it so he kind of faxed the image to them in some way and the guy printed it out and brought it over to me. And I was so excited. I mean, I, I still have that image. I'm showing my wife and my daughter a lot younger than she is now, but, and the other people in the station were excited about it. Like, wow. I mean, this, this is the way you couldn't attach files the way you do today, but it, it was pretty crude, but it impressed me. I, I really enjoyed seeing that. So now you go back before there was internet, uh, 
way, way back when I started doing field work, um, faxes were about the only thing you could do. You'd fax somebody, and of course, you wouldn't get an answer back for maybe a day and a half or two days. And it was kind of tough to communicate, but uh, we lived through it. And today, I mean, cell phones and whatever else, it's so much easier. You, you guys don't know how the, the other half lives. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Stevenson. It looks like we've reached uh, the, the time. Derek, you have a question? Yes. All yes. right. <laughs> Great to see and talk to you again, Dr. Stevenson. Um, yeah, I, I know you. Maybe. Not, not with all this on here, uh, but, but maybe. I vaguely remember the name. <laughs> the guy who ran from the lion. Yeah, yeah, that one, or the, the cheetah, or the elephants, or <laughs> anything, anything larger than a mouse. Okay. <laughs> right. So um, I, I guess I have a, a three question here. What was your longest research expedition? Um, would be the first one. Distance or time? Um, I guess time, time frame. Macquarie, the next, next longest, well... Macquarie and one of the trips to New Zealand, one of the trips to New Zealand was marginally longer. Another one was marginally shorter, about three months, India, three months. So I've had several trips of some length. Um, and then what, uh, one of the most interesting, I guess, encounters with wildlife during your research, I know you had the penguins and elephant seals there. Um, and then I was there for some of it in uh, Africa and in Thailand, but uh, just curious if you had any more. I think the first time I saw a cheetah, which was on a totally different trip, but people don't expect to go to Africa and see cheetahs. Uh, I really hadn't thought about that. I mean, seeing grizzly bears, that's kind of neat too. Uh, chipmunks, no, wait a minute, chipmunks, all that, all that neat. Okay, that would be up there. I think, uh, I mean, some of the things I've gotten most excited about are particular fungi or slime molds. I get more excited over them. They don't chase you, they don't threaten you. So that's kind of nice. In the background, oh, that's a neighbor who's covered in, no, it's not a neighbor. It's a person, one of the two people in that picture I told you about. That's my wife who's been with me on a lot of expeditions, not to the bad places. She wasn't certainly not in Macquarie, but she's, She's been a, well, she's been my co-collector and my field assistant for a long time. And some of you might find that hard to believe, right? Gals don't do that, do they? <laughs> Gals do that. Some of them are better field people than guys. Uh, and my last, question? Yeah, my last question there. Well, I know uh, as far as doing field research and getting in the field, uh, you're – you have limited supplies and stuff, especially as far away as you've gone. Uh, what's some of the biggest obstacles to overcome in the field um, with doing research? I know like some stuff likes to break and doesn't last a lot. How do you improvise and get your research done? Well, I had to prepare some cultures with auger uh, using a, well, basically a sterilizer. And a, we had that one physician, he had little offices or a little working space. I had to use what he had to prepare the plates, in other words, the auger plates, to do some culturing for some of the things I studied. And that, that was pretty tough. I mean, I did, really didn't know what I would do. Uh, I mean, you can improvise. Uh, I needed specimen containers. And of course, there was no supply. You couldn't order anything in Macquarie. So I asked around for the group. Now, some of you are so young, you don't remember film cameras and slides. I'm using some alien terms you don't know. Color slides, okay. A few of you, okay, yeah. Uh, slide film used to come in these little plastic canisters. And I ask around, anybody who empties a canopy or a little canister, save it because I can use it for a specimen container. And I did, I brought back, I ran out of the little box of stores boxes I took. So I used anything you could find. Match boxes, uh, little film canisters, whatever else. You have to improvise. And there's a story about Darwin, which I don't know whether it's true or not, but I've heard it several times, being in the field without any specimen containers and having something in each hand, but finding something you wanted to take back to the lab and he carried it back in his mouth. 
I don't know if I want to resort to that, but if you're desperate, there are things you will do. And uh, I mean, well, I'll tell you another story, which has a really sad ending and don't anybody cry. Uh, I was out in the field actually by myself at the time, not too far from the station. And I saw a specimen and I knew it was first record from the whole South Polar region. And I reached out and I got it and I stepped in a hole between the two tussocks and went crashing down. And that specimen was more important than me. I still have it. I, there was no way I would lose that specimen. I mean, I mean, I was badly bruised or whatever else. The specimen made it. So you make sacrifices. You know? Again, you, you can giggle after I'm gone. Don't laugh now, it looks bad. But yeah, it, it sounds ridiculous, but I also say that uh, I've been, I mentioned this term early, I've been incredibly lucky to have had the experiences throughout my lifetime. And uh, someday I should sit down and write a book about them. Whoops, I've already done that, haven't I? Yeah, huh? one, one day a book showed up at my office and it was the, the tales of your research experiences. A, a good read, I must say. Sad in places, isn't it? Well, there, there's certainly some stories and adventures. Absolutely. Uh, I would recommend uh, checking it out. All right, with that, we are going to have to close. Um, we're, we're run short on our time. I want to thank Dr. Stevenson uh, for providing a wonderful presentation. I very much enjoyed it. Uh, you're certainly welcome to reach out, and I'm sure he would uh, respond to any emails or further discussions. Uh, I also want to thank Laney and John, because without Laney and John working to organize and look through the logistics and timing and make sure this all runs smoothly, um, w this wouldn't happen without uh, their, their work. So I very much appreciate their work. And I'll close, I'll close by uh, putting in a, a plug for next week. Uh, I'd like you all to invite a friend or two, uh, encourage them to register. Next week, we have Dr. Justin Wright from Duke University. He's going to give a presentation from the Arctic to the tropics, from the desert to the wetlands. Disturbance is everywhere. Lessons from a globe-trotting ecologist. Follow us on Facebook. Check us out on Instagram. Invite a friend. Thank you all for your time, and you have a great uh, evening, and we'll see you here next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.